Good afternoon. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Next year is an election year. Not a big election year, but it's an election year. We've had a number of candidates that are going to be, I think, potentially swapping seats in a number of different ways. It's going to be a fascinating year, I think. Um, please welcome, I'm very excited uh, to welcome my guest today, current Senator Josh Green. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate it. So I bring all of that up because there has been not just speculation but conversation about Senator Josh Green running for lieutenant governor. So I invited her down to the show to talk about that and his interests and, and, and so forth. So again, welcome to the show. Glad you can join us. Start off, please, by telling us a bit about yourself. You, you're a doctor, first of all. Yes. Okay, tell us about that. Sure. How long have you been a doctor? What do you do? So I'm an emergency room doctor. Okay. Uh, it, in truth, I'm not a career politician. I'm a local physician. I came to Hawaii in 2000 uh, with the National Health Corps. I had a National Health Corps scholarship, which meant that there was no doctor on the Big Island in the southern part, in Kau. And I received a, um, a scholarship to come and be the doctor in Kau. So after graduating medical school, I had gone and worked in medical missions. I had experienced healthcare abroad in Africa. I wanted to go and make a difference. So when I got that posting, I became the doc for 8,000 people in the Kau district. And during that time as a doctor for four years at first in the National Health Corps, it was an incredible way to begin to experience Hawaii. I was the only healthcare provider for many miles around, for 1,000 square miles, all the way up towards Volcano and through Ocean View on the Big Island. So. If you're ever going to be immersed in a culture, that's one of the most incredible ways to do it. So I saw the struggles that people were facing. I immediately became immersed in Hawaiian culture in Kau on Big Island. Uh, I had a ton of friends and new family that were Hanai family and Filipino families that took me in and um, Japanese families. And I ultimately met my wife shortly thereafter. So all of that changed my life to be a doctor there. I also work emergency medicine. So I was a family doctor trained in Pennsylvania. I went to uh, med school back in the East. And then when I came here, I did both the clinic work at the uh, Community Health Center on Big Island, Colorado, and also ER, which is what I do now. So being a physician, I saw the crystal methamphetamine um, addiction crisis. I saw that firsthand. I saw children that would die because of neglect. I saw the rampant diabetes. And I began to understand what the people were suffering uh, with and the challenges we had. So for those four years, I was all doc. I didn't have the first clue about Hawaii politics. I didn't know the names of the other people that we see now in Congress. I didn't know anything. Uh, but being a doctor and still being a doctor, I, I work still full time in the emergency rooms on the Big Island every weekend, basically. I go back and people come in from their car accident or they have pneumonia or heart attacks and I'm their guy. So like I and said- You've been their guy for- for 17 years for now. 17 years. Yeah, so I've been a local doc for 17 years here. I actually came directly out of residency, uh, graduated in June, and by July I was working as a doc uh, first a few weeks in Hilo and Pahoa because they were short until they had it ready for me to become the doc in now, We have had, I mean, just talk about Hawaii for a minute, we've had a doctor shortage. Yes. Now, have we improved that? I think we. I think I've heard that we've improved the doctor shortage. We have, um, but there's still a gap. And then there was a nursing shortage yes. as well. Uh, just to go off topic for a little bit here, um, what are the what are some concerns there that we should be looking at? Well, I'm glad you bring that up because that's in doing the National Health Corps, which was a loan repayment way to bring doctors into the rural areas. I saw that that worked. And so then at the legislature, I created the Hawaii Health Corps, which we now fund to bring scholarships to doctors and nurse practitioners and psychologists to go work in underserved areas. So we have a physician slash provider shortage of about six or 700 providers at any given time. We have 3,200 healthcare providers, physicians that are licensed in the state of Hawaii that are actually working. We have a lot of people licensed more than that, 7,000 people, but a lot of retirees. We need another 700 providers and doing scholarship programs Doctor and nurses, both combination, both because nurse practitioners are also now right. uh, another bill that I wrote and passed as a reflection of what I experienced as a doctor in Kau. We now make nurse practitioners full PCPs, primary care right. providers, right. so they can do prevention and they can follow diabetes and high blood pressure. Which so all huge. these things. Yeah, but yes. we still have an issue and I'm going to stick on this for a minute and yes. then we're going to jump off. Great. We still have an issue with the fact that 
our rural health care is, and we were talking about this before, our yes. rural health care still is, st is across the country is bad. Yes. Here, it's bad because you have to get on a plane right. to come to Oahu. Yes. What can we do, and what conversations have been had to address that? Well, uh, let me even give you the numbers. So nation statewide, we're 22% short on all providers. If you go to the neighbor islands or the rural parts of Honolulu, we're 40% short of providers. What can we do? We can bring people in through scholarship programs. We can sustain and enhance the community health centers. If we tripled the size of our community health center footprint, everyone would have a provider, everyone on Medicare and Medicaid. In Hawaii, we have 362,000 people of our population on Medicaid. We have another 200,000 on Medicare all of whom have trouble finding a, a physician or a nurse practitioner on any given day. So we have to, number one, we cannot accept the current craziness that's coming out of D.C. Mm -hmm. The bill that they have is catastrophically bad. Uh, absolutely. And that would yeah. crash health centers and rural hospitals. So if I become lieutenant governor, which we'll address going forward, one of my principal um, battles will be on behalf of Hawaii families and actually families across the country to defeat that kind of a proposal. I have proposals of my own which we can come back and do other shows on. Absolutely, yes. But that's a, a signature piece. In addition to that, you have to also look at what it means to just bring providers into the state in general. It's very difficult because it's of... It's not just providers, though. It's also making sure that the facilities are there that's right. on each island and that each island can, if properly funded through various mechanisms, right. each island should be able to have its own centers without having to fly off to Oahu just to get a procedure done. Exactly. So all basic care needs to be provided at all times, which is primary care, prevention care, and life-sustaining care like I provide in the ER plus OBGYN, another unique form of care. Yeah. I would even add to that, in my opinion, uh, psychologic and psychiatric services, and also drug treatment. I think that's core primary Absolutely. care. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's, and more and more, I, I, you, were, you were talking earlier about the opioid concerns that we have across the country, right. and we know that's been an, an issue here with the meth project. Um, one of my good friends is, was, was really uh, executive director of that for a while as yes. well. Um, uh, Georgie DeCosta, she's great. That's but anyway, awesome. okay, let's go. Let's shift back. Okay, so so thank you for the background on that part of it. Now, you are currently a senator. How long have you been a senator I've been here, a, in, here in Hawaii? I've been a senator, state senator, for nine years, and uh, that's been from Kona, or the. At one point, my district was Kona and North, and then there was redistricting, and then it became Kona and Kau South. Okay. But that's been for nine years, and before that, I was kind of very honored to become the state representative. So I did four years in the state house, and then it's been nine years in the state senate. Okay, okay, so four years. So two terms in the state house, and then nine years, which means you're in your third term. I'm in my third term, but one of those terms was the uh, two-year transition term, so. Oh, right, from uh, 2010 to 2012 from that census. Exactly, so uh, this will be, I serve two, two terms in the house, this will be three terms in the senate, and I made a commitment to my children and my wife. My um, my family knows that I have a lot of interests and I have a lot of uh, passion for many different areas, not just politics and policy, but also as a doc. I made a commitment to them that I would not be one of those kind of people that will languish in the legislature for decades. So there's a lot of great work to be done at the legislature, but after my three terms in the Senate and two terms in the House, I think I have a lot more to offer, and that's really why I'm doing this. Also, we do have in some areas, a void of leadership. We need someone that actually is going to have the capacity to fight for Hawaii families without concern for politics. And as a doctor, I have an incredible latitude to both speak my mind and use the experience I have. So that's why I'm doing it. We can go into great deal about what I fight for, but we'll, we'll that's go the into reason. We'll more of that in a minute, yeah. absolutely. But yeah. okay, all right. So um, now, how, but let me let me ask this. Let me just jump in. Yes. When you when you were when you first became representative, right. Was that an open seat? No. Were you appointed? How did that happen? Uh, I ran against a gentleman who, um, you know, was a heartfelt person. He had uh, he was a Republican incumbent, and I went door to door in my scrubs for seven months, and I lost forty pounds walking door to door. I went through three shoes, three yeah. pairs of running shoes. You've experienced that too, yeah, Carl. Absolutely. And it was a great experience because even to this day, every time I'm at the airport coming and going from the district. Yeah. Someone will stop me and say, hey, I remember you when you came to my door. You're that young guy yeah. in your scrubs, in shorts, talking to us about what you thought you'd fight for. You're still that young guy because we're the same age. We're the same age. <laughs> and, and, I, and I still believe the same things. But it's the, um, that, that was a good start for me. So when I beat that guy, he um, they didn't see it coming. I'm a dogged campaigner, and I work very hard at this because I figure if I'm going to invest and take other people's trust to 
you know, be expressed through me. It means something. Right. And I, that campaign, I, I went door to door for those seven months. But when I won the Senate race, I also, um, I first challenged a candidate who, who was an incumbent and bowed out. Then I had a primary. I made 16,800 phone calls. Um, and walk plenty as well. And those phone calls were direct calls to my constituents up and down the coast of West Hawaii. It's what uh, my opponents can expect from me this next time. I don't like to leave any stone unturned. And look, people deserve to, to hear from their candidates. If a better candidate than me is out there, that's good. But they should know. And so they'll get to talk to me. They'll watch your show. They'll watch a lot of other um, venues. But if they want to actually talk to me, they should call me on my cell phone. And you can give them my cell phone. You can give them my email. What's your cell phone? My cell phone is 937-0991. And it's been that number forever. On the weekends, guys, I'm on call at the hospital, so be mindful. But any other time, call me and ask me what I believe in. Or tell me what your nephew is suffering with. Or tell me what you worry about for your spouse. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we can actually do in Hawaii. It's a small state. I don't think a lot of other states have that luxury. but that's what I'm trying to be as a person. Win, lose, or draw, expect that from your candidate. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the biggest disconnects we have is the actual voters being able to connect more directly with a lot of our candidates and or electeds. And, and it seems like once, once many people get elected, they slowly shift away from that type of face-to-face -face connection. Yes. And I think that's a shame. Yeah. Uh, aside from sign waving. Yeah. Uh, we need to make sure that we can hear. I have a strange experience uh, as the doc still. It is not uncommon. I mean this, Carl. It's not uncommon. I'll be taking care of somebody, and they'll come in with broken ankle or pneumonia or whatever. And once we get their pain under control or they're doing better, they will start asking me about what are we doing on the rail? What are we doing on health care access? What are you doing, Josh, on this or that issue? And sometimes it's funny because uh, I'm not particularly partisan. Sometimes it's like this really wonderful, crusty old Republican guy <laughs> who I just set his like shoulder back into place. And he wants to ask me about politics. And I am reluctant because I want to be in that moment as their doctor. But I realize people have a chance to talk to me. And it's that lens that has been unique for me. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's it's a strange lens. I've had people also say, I'll never vote for you again. You're not giving me pain pills. Shocking, <laughs> shocking wow. experience. And wow. I say, look, we're trying to take care of people in society. Let's separate these issues. Yeah. But I'm here if you're suffering. So yeah. I have these two universes that have collided, but they collided and it worked for, I guess, what, 13 years. I, I think a very important part, of, of, as part of your job as a full-time emergency doctor, yes. you see your constituents every weekend, at least those that come through. Yes. So that is definitely a difference. So whether or not you're able to hold a town hall on that situation yeah. or uh, individual one-on-one -on -one as you go, yeah. that still gives people the opportunity to connect to you. Well, imagine this. Uh, and I've, I've heard one of, one of the other uh, um, candidates say that we're all about the same and it'll be based on ethnicity or this or that. It's silliness. And you're going to talk to him in the coming weeks. But uh, good friend, actually. It's just not true. Last weekend, I had a kid come in with a febrile seizure, 105.3 degrees, mm. a baby, okay, two-and-a-half-year-old baby, basically near a coma, just had the seizure. The family was too poor to afford Tylenol, and the grandfather brought this kid in. Now, I'm thinking, how do I take care of that child? And I'm also at the same time wondering in the, in the subsequent hours, what would we have done if this family was one of the casualties of a new health care bill that cut back on our Medicaid expansion? Yeah. That child would have either died or some other nurse could have done what I did as a doctor and saved the child. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying that child would have died because they either wouldn't have come to the hospital because they would have been afraid that they would go bankrupt. Exactly. These are real things that I experience. And I've talked about these issues until you know the sun rises and sets because Absolutely. a few people with some expertise might just be good for government we haven't seen that a lot we but haven't seen that a lot let's hope it happens it goes askew right but uh, it's time for us to take a quick break great so thank you again for joining us and thank you so much for joining us this is think tech hawaii's movers shakers and reformers politics in hawaii series i'm your host carl campagna thanks to you again many many thanks to our guest today uh senator josh green we'll be back in one minute watching Think Tech Hawaii, which streams live on thinktechhawaii.com, uploads to YouTube, and broadcasts on cable OC16 and Alelo 54.
Great content for Hawaii from Think Tank. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better, try a little more, hard and every more, let's do what we can. Aloha, my name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, which you can see live at from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from clean energy technology folks to community groups to politicians to regulators to the utility. So please join us Tuesdays at 1 o'clock for Power Up Hawaii. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers Politics in Hawaii series. I'm your host, Carl Campagna. Once again, welcome, Senator Josh Green. Good to see you again. All right, so now we're going to shift. A previous segment was a bit of your history yes. and what got you where you are right now. Right. Um, and a lot of conversation about, about really health care. And that's a huge conversation I want to have going forward yes. as well. But in this segment, what I want to focus on is Lieutenant Governor race. Right. Now, you have... Have you officially come out and declared that you are running for lieutenant governor, or is it just one of those, you know, we're thinking about it? I'm going to run for lieutenant governor. I, I intend to file the papers when the time comes. Okay. Uh, I've made a commitment to my family and friends uh, to run. I still want to hear from a few more people across the state because I've already been going statewide, uh, hosting talk stories, Maui, Big Island. I'm headed for Kauai soon, and I've been on Oahu already, too. I really think that people deserve to give me an earful if they think I am qualified or not qualified, or if they think I should run for a different office. As we know, there are a lot of relevant offices. State Senate's important. I think the lieutenant governorship is very important. We'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, the governorship and the congressional seats. I had some soul-searching time with my wife uh, after the legislative session. We decided as a family that having me here with my 10-year-old and 6-year-old not off in D.C. is better for us. And the expertise I bring on some of the issues, which I think you'll ask me about or what mm -hmm. I intend to do, homelessness, health care access, living wage, these are things we'll talk about in a Absolutely. second. I can be a, a very powerful advocate. And that's where I intend to make um, kind of my job important as lieutenant governor. I will make the final decision in the coming month, uh, and I will share with everybody. But I think it's safe to say that you should expect me in the lieutenant governor race next year. OK, well, I am, for one, uh, of the belief that we need more candidates yeah. running for more offices. Sure. Um, because of one of the things that was mentioned is, and that is, we have sort of a void. Yes. Uh, as soon as one person retires and this person goes away, or all of a sudden, who's going to be there and who's going to do what, and who has the experience right. and the chops to be able to step into some of these big issues that are really facing us? So, you're right. Um, so I appreciate that you're running for lieutenant governor. Um, whether or not I would support and vote for you is a whole different conversation to have. It's not for uh, it's not for this show, but it's about this is about just learning more about you and about what your vision is. So, but before we go into your vision, right? Tell me from your perspective. Your understanding of the role of lieutenant governor. Sure. Uh, with, the, with the direct caveat that lieutenant governorship is what you make of it. Some lieutenant governors across the country and in Hawaii have been very influential. Others have not had any ability to function under their governor. The formal role of lieutenant governor is to essentially be the secretary of state for the state of Hawaii and to step in for the governor when he or she is traveling or if he or she has a health problem uh, or, God forbid, is unable to continue in the office. You can be a professional partner of the governor, and you can also own different issues if the governor will let you work on them. I'm more proactive than that, and we'll I talk about that. I think that part, though, yeah. is the key. Is, is, yes. It's the relationship between you and the governor, yes. or the lieutenant governor and the governor, and what the governor is also interested in willing to let you do. Yes. How, what are your expectations for those dynamics, no matter who the governor is? Well, uh, let me even first say that I, I met and spoke with Governor Ige yesterday. Uh, and he understands that, first of all, we go way back and we have a good relationship. He understands that I intend to be a passionate solution person uh, on the biggest problems that our families are facing. Number one, living wage. I'll be an advocate there. He will let me work on that issue. 
I've already been crusading on new solutions for homelessness, as you've seen. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. the, your, your legislation to, to have homelessness, or at least certain aspects of homelessness, be a medical issue. Yes. And that's an important discussion, which really goes back to the 80s when Reagan decided to kick everybody out who had medical or exactly. had, had mental health needs. Yes. And that has been something we're still trying to find solutions for. That crisis resonates exactly from that point all the way through uh, our current calendar. And so many people are suffering out there. And that will be an issue that I take up. What they did in Utah was Lieutenant Governor took that issue, owned it, and they essentially beat yeah. back homelessness for a lot of suffering people. And it was a great success. That is something that uh, has occurred to me. Also, needless to say, I'll be working on uh, strategies to have universal health care for the state of Hawaii. And I don't just mean universal health care coverage. I, I mean actual care. I need to push on that one a little bit. Yes. Um, this last session, and you know that I, I, I feel very fortunate that I was able to get a, a bill introduced yes. calling for universal health care. Yes. Um, it got introduced. It got 12 co-signers yes. from the Senate. Yes. It didn't get a hearing. I, I wasn't the health chair at this time. I'm the human services chair. So had I been the health chair, you can bet it would have been heard. And I actually uh, chaired in 2006 the Universal Health Care Task Force. And we showed in that task force, because I was chairman of the health committee in the House at the time, that you can have universal health care in the state of Hawaii. It would require a cost, 5.6% uh, fee. But everyone making up to $90,000 would pay less for health care. Everyone between 90 and 135,000 would pay the same. And over 135,000, there'd be a little extra cost. Okay. We could do universal health care. We could talk about uh, that on a whole show. I would like a whole other show on that. Because yes. that's, cause one of the other issues, one of the other bills that, that was introduced was getting funding into HHA. Yes. Uh, the, 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 that would have been the committee right. that was going to create that policy pathway, right? Right. That didn't happen either. Yeah, and it's a... Uh, it's a space that I can function in because yeah. I will tell you right now in advance, knowing who the potential candidates are in this race, I'm going to be the only progressive candidate that can win statewide. That is absolutely a fact. Now, we can have this discussion over and over again, and we will in the community, but everywhere I go, families tell me they're getting crushed under the weight of special interests, and they need somebody to push back. So what you've seen from me is when I saw that pesticides were getting sprayed on kids at schools, I pushed against Monsanto when no one else would. When I saw that we needed to expand Medicaid, I made sure that we went from 250,000 to, 200, to 362,000 people so we didn't continue to have a much higher uninsured rate. I'm not afraid to fight those fights because I have this other life. I have a, a physician life, whereas anyone else in this race, unless someone comes out of nowhere, which would be really great actually, with other experiences, Everyone else ends up being a career politician. So I'm a unique person. I'm not saying that makes me the best person. I'm saying that that makes me the most effective person to fight on these controversial issues where other people shy away from, like you described. So what you're saying there is someone who's more of a career politician is more subject to their supporters and who is endorsing them versus, you know, here's a set of issues to take care of a bunch of people that live in this state that need it and not necessarily being tied to who is donating to me? Well, I'll say it again. I'm more of a local doctor than I am a career politician, no doubt at all. And mm -hmm. you need go no further than me flying back and forth to Kona every week to do a 72-hour shift with my uh, community and constituents. So yeah. it's tiring, but it's Especially valuable. During the session, during the session, because you, you've got 12, 15-hour days. Every day, well. uh, every week during the session, I still go back and do a 48-hour shift instead of a 72-hour shift yeah. because it's, it is the way I can keep these two lives going. And I, I think it's important. It's really for other people to judge. But I will be that progressive candidate, and I enjoy it. It so makes it for fun. The issues. The issues. So you want yes. to be able to tackle homelessness. You yes. want to be able to tackle health care and yes. hopefully finally deliver a universal health care for Hawaii, right. perhaps be a model for the rest of the country. Right. We are at that place right now nationally where we either, they either, the current Republican in tr Republicans in control will either crush yes. the entire health care industry or we can fix the Affordable Care Act or just go universal health care. Those are really the only ways to improve upon. Right. Uh, but in order to fight against that, I do agree with you. We need someone who understands from the operations side what's going on and how to better make sure that we're taking care of the people. Imagine, imagine for a second 
that I'm selected. I'm chosen to be lieutenant governor, and I hope with all my heart I am. Because when I run a campaign, I go all in. I'll be the only physician in the country that's in higher office as a lieutenant governor or governor. Not so, since Howard Dean, right? Not since Howard Dean. And Howard Dean's a personal friend and is helping me with my campaign. I was also one of the first Dean Dozen. He endorsed oh, okay. me in my first race, and I'm one of their guys that was able to win and stay. So that's been actually just a heartfelt honor because I love Howard. Yeah. I will be that guy that can go nationwide. Next week, I'm in Seattle to speak with the mayor of Seattle and their council and to see all of their homeless shelters, their small, ho small homes, and to address the University of Washington on our solutions and the ideas I have for Hawaii. I'm already reaching out because I want us as Hawaii to be a leader on many issues, and we can be. We're better than most other states on health care, but we have a long way to go. We have a crisis on homelessness, but we have the capacity, because we're a small, contained state, to all pull together and work on this issue. We have the capacity to get enough care for people who have opioid addiction. We have the capacity to take to, care of our rural health care. To work on our rural health care system. Yeah. So these kind of challenges, which seem very large when you're in the mainland, and they are large, can be taken up by a lieutenant governor. Will the governor sometimes look with their eyebrows raised and say, oh my god, I got this lieutenant governor who's going off? <laughs> of course an, they will. An activist advocate lieutenant governor. It is yeah. OK. You know, I was embraced by my West Hawaii community, over 80% of the vote continuously, Republicans and Democrats. And far left and far right people supported me because I'm a doctor first. And then, a, and then an activist, it's, like you it's say. It's about taking, it's about that connection with people and what are you doing and, and how do you communicate with them. Uh, okay, so in the last like minute and a half we have, um, round out your vision. My vision is that we do several things. We focus actually on the core problems that Hawaii families are facing. They don't have an adequate uh, living wage. That means they can't afford housing and with our housing rates the way they are, people are two or three paychecks from becoming homeless not to mention the 8,000 individuals that are already homeless. Sometimes one paycheck away. It has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. We have to preserve the Medicaid and Medicare programs for the country, and we have to do it in Hawaii, even if the federal government... Especially if. Especially if they go astray. And finally, we have to take on the larger special interests, interests that have run rampant over Hawaii. And in this case, I'm talking about public health issues like toxic pesticides, those kind of poisons that are creating additional problems. We're seeing a surge in chronic health problems, and we're seeing a surge in things like autism. And it's no coincidence that these things are going on on the current leadership's watch over the last decade. You will have a crusader in me if I'm chosen as lieutenant governor. These are some of the core issues. Now, there are many other issues that I look forward to taking up. But in our 30 minutes together, I really wanted to convey yeah. that. Now, I'll be spending the next year talking to Hawaii families in person. I'll be on shows, I'll be out in the field, and I'll be in the emergency department, and hopefully you'll call me on my cell phone. Going forward, we actually can have leadership for people against special interests, but it has to be done all across the country. This is going to be one spot. Absolutely. No, and I thank you for that, and I thank you for that message. Um, congratulations to you for, for running. Yeah. I'm assuming you're running. We should all assume that now. Um, looking forward to the next year, and I do invite you back at your availability to come talk on any one of these issues. I would love to do a special episode on living wage, special episode on health care and diving into some of the rural concerns that we have and how to address that. Some of the challenges that we have and how we can actually address some solutions. And that was, the, to me, the most important word you used yes. to me was solutions yeah. to the problems we have. I don't like talking about problems if there's not a solution, but that's because I'm a project manager. So thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank Truly you, appreciate the opportunity. Welcome back anytime. Uh, thank you for joining us again. This is Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, Politics in Hawaii series. This was our show with Senator, current Senator Josh Green, candidate, we believe, for Lieutenant Governor for next year. So thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Take care.